So for our agenda, uh, we're going to go through a quick background on who I am uh, and my brokerage, Vista Sotheby's International Realty. And then we're going to discuss the meat of things on why you signed up Lending 101. And we'll go through the home buying process. And then we'll have some Q&A towards the end of it. Now, do know that real estate, I understand, is going to be maybe one of the biggest, biggest purchases of your life. And there's going to be so many questions that could be that's going to be on a micro level. That's why I do a full consultation. It's going to be one on one. Or if you have a family member that's going to be deciding with you and it's free so we could dig deeper into some of your questions. OK, so I understand that there might be some some more questions that we have to discuss individually. So that being said, just about Calcom for those that are non members yet, but are employees of the Providence uh, for Providence Little Company of Mary. Calcom, um, a lot of the Koreans start uh, somewhere. And in this case, actually, Calcom used to be called the Comto, uh, for those that are not aware. And that was short for Li Little Company of Mary Hospital. And that was started back in 1968. OK, and uh, if, you're a if you're an employee of that, or some of the other employee groups that are registered under Calcom. If, there, if you have other members, aunt, uncle, child, cousin, and other, others listed here, they are eligible to become members for free. And all they need is a dollar deposit and they can already become a member and they just have to show one form of government ID. Those that are not aware, credit union much like, uh, it functions much like a bank, wherein you have a savings account, uh, checking, money market, IRA. Uh, we also have all sorts of different types of loans like mortgages, uh, other you know, credit cards, personal loans, and auto loans for those that are not aware. If you have any other questions to become a member or any other products and services, uh, you can contact at the bottom here Debbie Flanagan. Uh, she's the membership director. And just to clarify my relationship with Calcom, I work with them on a partnership level. So they have members that are looking for homes. So that's where I come in. I'm a real estate agent. I help the members um, get through their whatever homes that they're looking for. So I'm a real estate agent. I'm an investor. And Calcom holds a special place for me because that's where I started my career, actually, as a teller up until I became uh, one of the executives. And then um, eventually I, I became a real estate agent. So. I take care of the members well. So that's my, my quick background and you have the rest of the items here. Okay. A lot of people ask me uh, why I went with Sotheby's International Realty and uh, there's other companies there that are like Century 21, Keller Williams, Berkshire Hathaway. And I mentioned a while ago that I come from a credit union background and the most important thing for us as employees was to make sure that we took care of our members. and. Sotheby's, although it's known for its luxury homes that it sells, we have a saying in the company that luxury is not about the price point. It's about the service and the experience. So uh, I took pride when I was a Calcom employee that I gave the best service on any member that walked in uh, through our doors. And this was the company that had that vision and the same values that I had. And it was just a natural fit for me to work with this company. And that's why I do even those virtual one-on-one -on -one consultation. It used to be one-on-one uh, -on -one physically, but now we can't do that yet. But at least it's, there's still that one-on-one -on -one touch so we can go deeper into your situations, okay? So, so lending 101, I still go through the materials. Um, a lot of these are going to be self-explanatory. So my intention here is to focus on those that you'll see in blue. And that way you know that, to me, I think those are more important. And that one is something that needs to be explained a little bit more. That's why I want to focus in on those. And then the rest of them should be self-explanatory. Okay. So the main things that will affect your rate would be uh, your, your credit score and the history that you've had with it. So you might have a really good credit score, but it could be quote unquote called a soft credit if you've only had maybe less than a year or less than two years. Who determines what a soft credit is will be dependent on the lender. Okay, so that's one thing. And then the other thing that will affect your rate is the what we call as the loan to value. So just to make the conversation easy, let's say the house that you're looking at is about 500,000. Um, and the loan to value typically for a conventional loan, and I think, what, and it's gonna be right here. So letter C is if you have 20% or more, sorry that I'm skipping, but that's the, that's the more typical one because that will give you the lower down payment. Um, so that means on a $500,000 loan, 20% down payment is 100,000. 
So your loan would be 400,000. So that means if you made a down payment of 20%, your loan to value or LTV, you'll hear people say that is it's 80% LTV. So the lower the loan, the, the more down payment, the lower the loan, typically your rate becomes better too, okay? But for some, that might not be possible. And you may have to be under 2A here, which is 3.5 to 5%, uh, which is the government-sponsored programs, okay? And there are uh, advantages and disadvantages. One advantage would be for low down payment is obviously you, you still have, you have more cash that you can hold on to. Or if you don't have it, at least you could already buy even with just a 5% down payment. These are some of the additional ones that you're going to be needing. Okay. So if you have any questions on those, just feel free to, to ask me. One of the questions that we have is, you know, what are the different options? Number one would be conventional. So we talked about that as a down payment. Typically, that's going to be 20%. If you want to do a government sponsored program, you're going to be under an FHA loan you, that you could do as, as low as 3.5%. But I think recently they've... Uh, I made that higher to 5%. That part, I'm not sure. Uh, we would just have to verify. And then if, if we have any veterans in here or if you know any veterans, one of the best benefits of being a veteran is you can get a VA loan and you don't have to do any down payment. And what are points? So mainly when you're getting a loan, there's two main things that you're going to be hearing. You're going to be paying for points and then you're going to be paying for fees. The fees are, what's the rest of them? So what are points? Let's discuss that, which is the second uh, row. Uh, th that's the second uh, item on our row here, points. So typically points is just uh, the percentage of what the lender will charge based on the loan amount, okay? Not to be confused with the purchase amount. So if you're getting $500,000 house with a 20% down payment, so your loan is 400,000, and some lenders will charge you between 1% of that to 1.25%. So 1% 1 of 400,000 would be $4,000, right? Or if it's going to be 1.25%, whatever that percentage is. So that's going to be the same thing for FHA um, and then same thing for VA loans. So that one, almost everything's the same. Now before, not to confuse you, but you might hear some of the terms that's called buying down the rate. So if you want to pay more points, if you're okay with that, so that means you could buy more points, uh, you could buy down the rate. So by paying more points, your rate can go down. So sometimes you'll see that the rates are very low. It's because sometimes they pay more points or the opposite. You might not have enough money to pay for the points, but that means if you're not going to pay points, they'll allow you, but your rates are going to go up. Okay. So that's that buying the rate comes into the picture. And then all, you're going to have the rest of the fees here, which is your fees, the origination fees, appraisal, escrow, title. We'll discuss a little bit more about that as we go along. One thing unique uh, that's going to be on the fourth row item here, um, MIP or mortgage insurance premium, or some they call it PMI, uh, private mortgage insurance. That's going to be unique to FHA because you're paying such a low down payment of about 35 to 5% that uh, they're going to ask you to pay an upfront fee of 1.75% of the loan. So if your loan is, if you only paid down, let's say 5% out of the 500,000, so that's uh, 25,000. So the remainder loan is 475,000 times 1.75% of that. That's your upfront fee. Okay. And then again, another unique thing about FHA, right below here is the annual insurance premium on top of the Initial fee, they're going to be charging you 0.85% of the loan divided by 12 months. So you're going to be paying for that in, in on a monthly basis for the remainder of the loan. Um, now, what you can do at some point is if you're below, I think it's about 80%. So if you're below 80% LTV or you pay down the principal, then you could refinance that loan. So then that way you don't have to pay for the uh, PMI or MIP, and typically, uh, depending on how the increase of the the loan value or, or the market value of the house, typically you could you'll refinance in about two. That's very quick, two years. That, but it'll go between average of three or four years, or sometimes five years, right? Depending on what market you're buying. Um, and just recently, the reason why I don't have it here yet because uh, I don't know if it's official yet. 
uh, with the government sponsored program, either it already started or it's going to be starting September 1, the government is actually charging an additional half a point. So the, the, the line item here that you see that 1% to 1.25%, um, I don't know if they're going to call it different, but if they do that, it's going to be 1.5 to 1.75% now. And I don't know what their purpose is. Uh, are they trying to discourage a lot of people buying homes? I'm not sure. And it's going to be unprecedented that I think they didn't have a long announcement for that before it kicks in because it might be already in effect or by September 1. And last but not the least, the funding fee, that's going to be unique to a VA loan. So some people will ask me, what's the best type of loan? You hear 30-year fixed, you hear adjustable, you hear interest only. And this is where I would say it depends on your situation. Adjustable rates have had a, a lot of negative press in the past because uh, you, you don't know what your rates are going to be after a certain time. So I'll give you guys an example. Uh, for me, I'm actually planning on buying a house for myself. And the one that I'm getting is not a 30-year fixed, which is common. I'm getting a 10-year fixed. So it's still 30 years, but the first 10 years is fixed. And after that, it's going to be dependent on what's happening on the market rate. It'll adjust, and that's all part of the contract. So there's still a fixed element to it. That's why I like it for 10 years. And who knows, by then, I'll be already be selling my house or I'll be renting it out. I might be refinancing it already at that point. So that works for me. So you want to just understand what's right for you so you can make that decision. I used to approve mortgages. I'm comfortable talking about them. And if you have any questions more on this, on what's right for you, that's where the virtual consultation will come into the picture. Um, and we can discuss it more. Now, obviously, a fix would be fixed. You know what's going to happen for the remainder of that loan. And then interest only, that one has very low fees, but it could go as high as 3700 monthly if the rates start to go up because that's sort of part of an adjustable rate also. If you did an adjustable type of loan, let's say, five years ago, it was supposed to go up, let's say, now because it could be a five-year fix and then it goes up. Ten-year fix, then it goes up, right? So if you did a five-year adjustable fix five years ago or 10 years ago, and it was supposed to increase right now, well, guess what? It was not going to increase because the rates actually went lower, right? So it depends on what's happening in the market, um, and it depends on what's right for you. Uh, I don't want to get too much into the details of this one, but I thought this was a very important one. I know there's a lot of details here, but the one thing you just need to know is back-end ratio. So if you add it, so let's say you added all of your current um, items that comes up on the credit report, everything that you owe, you put that all uh, and you added it up, how much you're going to be paying on a monthly basis, plus you add everything that you have to pay for the mortgage, divided by the income that you're going to be making, or if you have an income with your spouse or somebody else that's going to be buying a house for you, you, divide, you total that income. So all your expenses monthly, minus all of that income, whatever you get. Uh, right now, the standard is approximately about 43%. That's how the lenders will say, okay, you have enough income that we're going to lend you the money for this house or whatever your max that they're going to be allowing you. 43%. It's going to be different, but that's kind of like the average. And why is that average uh, important? The reason is a lot of the lenders big banks and even big credit unions will actually sell your loans afterwards. So you'll hear maybe from your friends and family that have that were paying, let's say, one institution, and the next thing you know, they're paying somebody else and then it goes to somebody else. Because what the what the banks and you know what the financial institutions want to do is do the loan, do it quick, earn some money. Some of them they'll keep it on the books, some they'll sell because if they sell that to the government, they make money also. And they don't want to have loans that might be on their books for too long because the loans are there for maybe sometimes 5, 10, 15, 20 years, and they just want to keep earning on the fees. Okay. Why did I say all of this? Uh, Calcom is actually one of the unique institutions right now that I know of that actually does not sell. And if they do not sell loans, that means that 43% does not have to comply with the government standards because the government will only buy loans that are within their standard. And because Calcom does not have to comply to that, I believe the rate, uh, the ratio for Calcom is at 55%. So that means 
they will allow you to get more more on you to go up more on your mortgage which will allow you to increase your purchasing power when you buy a house so that might make a difference between you getting the home that you really want versus a house that maybe you're just buying it just to say that you were all already able to buy a house. okay so that's that that's why i discussed this part and you want to make sure that when you're get going out there you know the difference between a pre-qualification a pre-approval and right now with the with the market like we, we have now that it's very hot the sellers are only buyers that have been pre-approved and the main difference is pre-qualified you call the lender you gave all of the data and they say i think i think uh you know joe black that you're gonna be uh, uh, that you can afford a five hundred thousand uh, dollar house so you want to be able to get to a point that you've given all of the data they've verified everything now that's a pre-approval and you want to get to that point so when when it's time for us to make an offer we have a solid offer that the sellers will, re will really look into that you're a serious buyer so we're at a historic lowest rate ever and what does that mean for you uh, this is not an exact science, but the way you want to look at it is on this example, the purchase price pre-COVID up 2019 19 until pre-COVID is 700,000, let's say, for the purchase price. Let's say that's what you were buying and you could apply this to whatever uh, you think you're going to be purchasing. 20% down payment for a conventional, 4% uh, rate at that time. Right now it's 3% and somebody's told me that it might even be lower now. So on a 30-year fixed, the payment or a four percent is twenty six hundred, while the twenty the three percent now is twenty three hundred. By virtue of one percent decrease from four to three percent, you have about three hundred dollars that you're paying less. So that's a little bit more than ten percent that you're saving right now. If you were to buy now and take advantage of that rate, that is why a lot of people are a lot of the buyers are trying to buy houses right now. Uh, by just getting that low rate and locking in that rate for a long period of time, you're going to be paying less. People sometimes will compare on the home value on the increase um, on their house. Uh, and But if what, what you want to think about it is whether you're doing 5% down payment or a 20% down payment, um, your loan eventually, it's going to go down while the value of your house is going to increase. And when it increases, it's going to be based on the total value of that house. So, so your loan might be four hundred thousand if you did a twenty percent down payment, and hopefully that keeps going down. But your house, which is worth five hundred thousand, which is going to increase, is going to go like that. So, what you want, so what you want to understand is you're creating that gap between your your pay down and the increase, and that's your ultimately your savings, right? And um, that could translate into eventually, um, if you're if you're by yourself, it's two hundred fifty thousand dollars of tax free when you eventually have to sell. Or if it's a if it's a, if it's there's two people like like typically a spouse, then it's up then uh, that's up to five hundred thousand dollars of tax free money. Um, and but you have there's certain rules that apply. You have to be living that, that it should be your primary residence. You should be living there in the past two at least within the two years out of the last five years um that you sold the house so there's a couple of things that have to play into that factor but those are the things on why you want to think about why you're buying a house right um then there's other uh, when you're buying a house so home warranty insurance not to be mistaken with home insurance which is on the next level there um so home insurance is optional which is typically for your appliances uh like your built-in oven or you know the ovens the big ones like your stove um, ac heater that kind of stuff home insurance would be for the house itself and then you don't want to forget about the property tax as you're planning that's about 0.8 percent of the home value not not the loan value but the home value okay and then if you have an hoa then you want to make sure you consider those um, in, in your calculation so a quick recap on on lending uh i i know we we went through that really quick uh and this was meant to just for you to start thinking about what you need to be considering. And if you want more information, I can direct you to somebody at Calcom or you can talk to me about it. So, but just to kick, do a quick recap, uh, you, know, you wanna know what, what affects your interest rate, which is your credit score, the history of your credit score, 
in the loan to value. Okay, uh, you want to get your documents ready because mo most likely than not, those are the same things that the lenders are going to be asking for. And uh, I don't know if I have it here and if I'm jumping too early on it, but um, you're always afraid that your credit might be ran and then your score. Uh, matter of fact, actually, uh, just for those that are um, curious, your score goes down two to three points every time your credit gets ran. So I know you want to be cautious, uh, but unfortunately, the big, uh, the, you know, Equifax, uh, Experian, all of these uh, credit bureaus, they don't give the algorithm. But uh, I saw it, I think it's one of the CEOs from those companies, and I also read this and went through some training that if you have your credit ran uh, three times within, let's say, a week or two, and again, it was because a range was given to me, the system is smart enough to know that, let's say, in this case, you're rate shopping for a mortgage, they'll only consider the, the drop of your score once. Okay, so something to think about. Uh, so you just want to plan out uh, who you're going to go with. And I always just recommend minimum two, and then at the most three, if you really want to shop, you know, and we can talk a little bit more about that. Number three is you want to understand the different options that you have um, that so that you know what are what your payments are going to be and what are the fees involved, right? So something could have a very low interest rate, but you're paying a lot of fees, or vice versa. So you want to just be careful with those, and you know I'm more than happy to discuss a little bit more about that. Number four is get your pre-approval. If you're buying a house, you want to get your pre-approval. That's one of the main essential elements. Okay. And then number five is we are at a historic low interest rate right now, you want to take advantage of that. Home buying process, okay? The main steps involved is you want to consult definitely with your real estate agent. And then, you know, what happens once an offer is accepted? And a couple of uh, the worries of a first time home buyer is, what if eventually I, there's something that's wrong with the house or I don't like it? You know, uh, there are ways to, for us to get you out of the offer uh, so you're not tied into it. So we'll discuss a little bit more about that. And then number three is uh, we have to be doing inspections, right? You know, and what do we do inspections once you have a house before before we get to the close of the escrow, okay? And just an FYI, uh, I get this question a lot, you know, what, how much is my fee in this case? Uh, because this is a home buying segment. Uh, so I'm assuming we have buyers here. It's actually the sellers that pay for the selling agent in the buyer's agent. So it comes off the seller's pot, okay? So for you, what you have to worry about is the purchase price, the lender fees, the escrow, all of that. So the agent fee does not come from you, okay? So if we do the con consultation, all of that, if we end up not doing, if you don't end up buying a house, then I work for free for you, pretty much. It's, it's all it, what it comes down to. And that includes for tenants, okay? So once you consult with a real estate agent, I, what are the things that, that we do, right? Uh, for me, at least, uh, I, I get to know your needs. Uh, it takes about 30 to 45 minutes. I ask a couple of questions, and you're going to be asking me questions. And th that's just to make sure that I understand what you're looking for. Um, then we go look at the uh, inventory that's, that's out there uh, and the statistics that, that will involve those inventory. I'll give you an example. So like, uh, and I'm using this one because uh, I have a house that's for sale right now. I'm representing the seller. We're selling house in, a house in Torrance. And I also have people buying in Torrance and Manhattan Beach. So for the South Bay, depending on where you're looking at, houses are selling between 15 to average 25 days if the price is right and everything is done right. But if you go to like City of Indio, uh, Palm Springs, Houses there are going for about 70 to 80 days. So, and that's just one th one of the pieces in looking at a house. Uh, so you, we have to craft a strategy around that. Uh, one thing that we'll do is we'll compare uh, what your current uh, situation is as renting versus if, if you were to buy a house. Um, this is gonna be a repeat for those that, have, that attended the seminar the other day, but just a quick one, uh, quick one here. So in this example, on the left-hand side in the box, uh, that's how much they were going to pay for two years in Redondo Beach, 67200 And then when we looked at their situation, if they were to buy this particular house that they were looking at, um, they were only going to be spending 60200 So the cost was going to be lower. Now, I just want to make that a distinction. If you see the interest monthly here, I only have 1500 
So that's not the mortgage. That's the interest portion of the mortgage. So if you were doing interest only, that's how much you would pay. But if you were doing principal and interest, the principal was not considered here because when you pay that, that's part of the cash flow, but that's not an expense because whatever you pay in principal, it's actually yours uh, when you eventually sell the house, right? So that's technically an asset, not an expense. So they were going to be spending less. And then in that particular area, based on the history, they were going to go up every year at least about $65,000 in value. So it was a no-brainer for them in this case to actually buy that house. So we can do something like that in your situation. So this is something that, uh, again, one of the data that we're going to be looking at. In this case, we see that in this particular zip code, if we sell a house within 30 days, typically, uh, we'll get a 7% price bump from what the offer price is. And it's been basically because these are houses that um, that doesn't have too many issues and all of that. They were staged well. So those would command better prices. So now, uh, if I'm representing the seller, I'll be discussing this and saying the importance of selling a house in 30 days. But in this case, this is a home buying course. If we're looking for deals, then we know, you know what? If, if a house is over 30 days, and if we see something that we really like in that, in, in, in those number of days time period that might be the way to go because the sellers are now getting anxious on if they can sell their house okay so that's how one way we would use a strategy to our advantage uh, once an, an offer is accepted what happens right so you have the one number one through five we, we were discussing that so now once we have an offer accepted we, we open escrow okay um, escrow is we're going to have a slide on this one, but escrow, for those that are not aware, it's a middleman between the seller and the buyers. So they don't side with anybody. Their role is to make sure that whatever off the offer was accepted for, that all of those conditions are met, okay? including the transfer of money and all of that stuff. So if you're the buyer and you're doing your down payment, it goes to escrow. It doesn't go to the seller. That way, um, the sellers don't have it until the, the whole transaction is done. Uh, so then the seller can't do anything with that money. But once we open escrow, you're going to go through inspections. We're going to go back to that one uh, just to elaborate. Uh, so you have the definition of what an escrow here is. And people always say, you know, what's the title? What, what, what do we need the title insurance for? Uh, the title. So as soon as you open escrow, title is also open at that time. The, the title is also looked at to make sure that the buyer, which is you now, will transfer to you correctly. So each side also pays for their own title. What that means is the sellers will pay for the title that it's clean going to the buyer. The buyer, if you have a lender, which typically there is one, you're, you're paying for the title that, um, so when the lenders are put on the lien as, uh, as a lien holder, then it's a clean title, so the buyer pays for that. Now, if you didn't have a lender and if you paid for it in cash, then you won't be paying anything on title. Okay. So that's the escrow and title. Let's dig deeper on, on what happens in an escrow. So we know that it's a middleman, but, it, but when we say we're in escrow, what are the things that really happens? So an escrow can be, it can be as quick as five days. And normally that happens when the buyers have cash and they don't need to do any inspections and all of that. They can close it really quick. Um, but typically, escrows, the quickest would be typically if there's a lender involved, it's 15 days. And even now it's about 21 days. But normally it takes about 30 to 45 days. And choosing a lender that can close quickly can sometimes be one of the biggest factors. Talking about that price is not everything, you could have the same price with another party. But if we can close quicker, um, and then the seller, if you put yourself in the seller situation, you might say, you know what, I'm going to go with the one that can get me the quicker money because they can close quicker. Okay, so so what, those are some of the things that we talk about uh, when, when we're strategizing. But in this particular example, date of acceptance was June 7. It's a 30-day escrow, so that's why it ends at July 7, right? And uh, so there's a couple of things that happens here, but not to get to too much detail. The, the, the second thing, the second, the, the second line there is 
when is the deposit of the buyer due, right? And then for the sellers, they have to provide, they have to disclose everything that they know about the house to the, to the buyers, so the buyers can do their own investigations and do their own research. For the buyers, now you have typically 17 days, and a lot of these are standard on the contract, but um, as, I, as me representing you, we would go through in each of these to make sure that you understand them. And these are some of the things that we can tweak. You don't necessarily need 17 days. If you took a look at this, look at this one. We started escrow um, June 7, and it doesn't, the buyer inspection doesn't end until June 24. So some, so some agents or some that, are, um, that may not be looking into this more, they would just do the default. But sometimes what we can do is we can technically do the inspection in two weeks or one week if we, if we have everything lined up. And we can tell the sellers that, you know what, we can make the inspections quicker. Um, and so we can remove that contingency. That's what we call a contingency. So as long as the buyer doesn't remove the contingency, the sellers are not sure that the buyers will go forward. That enables the buyer to actually back out. Um, so what are the different contingencies that are typically equipped with the buyer, right? So one would be the inspection contingency. Number two would be the appraisal contingency. So the, the lender will send an appraisal and the appraisal will have to say that, okay, we, know, we think that this value is correct. So if it doesn't get to that amount, you can back out of that, that deal or you could increase your deposit if you wanted to. And then number three is just in case there's something that goes wrong with lending that uh, the lender cannot give you that money or what, for whatever reason, that will also enable you to back out of the deal. And there's other things that we can consider, but those are the main things. So that's what happens. And then so on and so forth. Okay. So if you can see here, we set inspections until June 24. But you know, what are the typical inspections that we do? Typically, we do termite and mold. Um, and be, besides the home inspection, I, get, I just want to make sure that this is clear. This is all optional, and you get to choose all of the vendors that you want. But typically, the buyers may not have these vendors, or may, they, may, they may only know one, maybe the home inspector. Or maybe they have a termite guide that they know. So typically, they'll tell me, hey, Conrad, just arrange all of this. Um, and when they do that inspection, I encourage the buyers to be there so that you can ask all of the questions that you want to with the, with the inspectors. So, and how much do those cost? And these would come out of your pocket because these are your inspections, okay? Um, so the home inspectors are typically 575, so on and so forth. Um, and if the, ter the home inspector says, I think we need more plumbing, then we would, we would get an electrician or a plumber or whoever we need to. Those are the typical inspections. When you're buying a house, you want to make sure that you consider what your time frame is. Um, there's, there's different things that will happen. Uh, if you're, uh, maybe if you need to move to, uh, if you let's say, if you're from out of state and you need to move here and you want to be living here by September 1st and the typical escrow is 30 days already. So you have to be an escrow and you would have, should have already found a home by August 1st, and you should have been looking at homes before that and getting your pre-approval, all of that. So you want to be conscious with the time so you can prepare well, okay? Because there are some that they don't need to move right away, but there are some that do need to, so you want to plan accordingly. So the difference between a will and a trust, on a will, all you have to say uh, is, um, I'm the owner of this house, and if I die, uh, or whoever the owners are, I want this person to be the next person that will own this, this house. So that's what a will does. The difference to a trust is because once you do a will, even though you've, you already mentioned that, whether it's in writing or, or by word, but typically it should be at least minimum in writing, it still needs to go through probate, which is the court's way of saying it has to go through all of the legalities. Okay. And the reason for that is, and I'm not, I'm not a legal expert, but um, in the best way that I can explain this, think of this as the house. Think of this as the owner of the house. Okay? So what you're saying is, I'm the owner of this house. Okay. So if I die, this house will be owned by somebody else. Okay. So that transfer of ownership from you to somebody else it needs to go through probate, unfortunately. And how much does that cost? Uh, you have the, it's self-explanatory here. That's the estimate, okay? 
when you have a trust, how much does it cost? It only costs fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars. So if you're gonna buy a house, or if you know anyone that has a house, ask them. Do do them a favor and ask them if they have a trust. Um, and a lot of them don't. They want to get one. It will save them a lot of headache. Not only the cost, but also the time that needs to be spent in court. More than the money, it's actually the time uh, and the you know, just the, the agony of going through the motions that the, whoever the next person is, they can't take ownership because he has to go through this. The difference is, this is the owner right now, okay? This is no trust yet. Now you, you create a trust. So this, this owner is also the owner of this trust. And within that trust, because now the trust owns the house, it's saying within that trust that if the owners pass away, and they can always change that trust whenever they want. So there's two types of trust. That's the revocable and the irrevocable. Irrevocable from the word itself, you cannot change anything anymore. Um, I think there are tax advantages and there are pe there's reasons why people do that. But I've never crossed personally myself that would do something like that. Those that I've come across have been revocable. Okay. So for me and my wife, I'm going to use that as an example because we have a trust also. So we were... We, now we have a trust and the owners, the, the trust owns the house. And what this happens is if me and my wife pass away, because we've already said that in this trust, our, our kids are the ones that's going to be owning this house. So we may have passed away, right? But the trust still owns that house. So there was no need to transfer that house. It was still within that trust. And so as soon as me and my wife pass away, I think there's a, a living uh, th from that trust. You could you have to transfer that eventually to wh whoever the next owners are because that trust dies in I think 99 years. But it's it takes so long. Um, I and I, I'm not sure on the details of that. But the main point is our daughters, whoever we say it's going to be the next owners, will just go to them. That's the importance, and that's why you want to have a trust. And we're getting towards the tail end here. So to recap, what a home buying process is. Uh, you want to know what you want, and you want to study your finances. That's the first thing. Number two is you want to equip yourself with the data so you know when you're making an offer, are you making an offer that's right for that market? Because if the market is really hot and you're offering lowball offers, then you're just wasting your time, right? Or vice versa, you want to be intelligent like what happened in 2008. There's a way, there's an indicator to know that if it's already becoming a buyer's market by looking at the inventory, we didn't discuss that one here. We did discuss that uh, the other day. Uh, but there's, uh, there are telltale signs even before you get to that point. And then, then you know that you can do, do lowball offers. Okay? And, you know, you want to have your strategy in place. Number four is we've learned today that it's not all about the price. That it, you know, if you understand the contingencies, if you know how to work the contract, uh, if your agent is helping you with that one, then there's a good chance that even if you're not the highest offer, you may still be the best offer. Um, I hope you learned a thing or two today. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.